What's up, Packers fans? Aaron Negler here with Cheesehead TV, ready to talk some football with my good buddy, Andy Herman, as we do most weeks now that football is up and running. Andy, how the hell are you, buddy? I am doing absolutely fantastic. I have a feeling already this is going to be an awesome show, so I can't freaking wait, and it's always good to be talking to you. Always good to be talking to you, bud. Um, all right, let's 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 dive into uh, the topic du jour. As long as preseason is here, I think we're going to be talking about Jordan Love. And there's zero doubt in my mind that you and I very much see eye to eye when it comes to who Jordan Love is, what he's put on tape in these first two preseason games, what we saw during preseason, uh, during training camp practices. It just feels like a guy, a kid who is progressing. And that's not to say he's going to eventually be the Packers starter, even let alone a starter in the league. I think he will get that opportunity eventually where that is. I have no idea. But you certainly see the progression, which is all I think I'm talking about. I'm pretty sure that's what you're talking about. But you went on, I'm not going to say a rant because Andy Herman doesn't rant as far as I, I can tell, as far as I can tell. But you did, you have a bit of a soliloquy, let's say, uh, in one of your videos the other, a couple days ago, which I thought was perfect. And I'm not going to ask you to like rehash it here per se, but I do want to point out that what you said in regards to fans who seemingly want to supplant this kid like instantly, no matter whether it's Kurt Benker, now it's Danny Etling, like you just don't understand what you're looking at. Like that's, and I, that's not to say like we're all watching football. We're all hobbyists. Like we're not, you know, inside 1265 Lombardi. I totally understand that. But the idea that Danny Etling or Kurt Benker are better quarterbacks than Jordan Love, just that blows my mind and you handled it a hell of a lot better than I could handle it because you know Aaron Nagler I'll just yell at people and like that's that's dismissive nonsense but I thought you were, were pretty damn eloquent in regards to the idea of what the traits are when it comes to Jordan Love and how we've seen those traits uh start to be in service of what's being asked of an NFL quarterback yeah, and I think you hit the nail on the head when you you know said it initially with the word progress, right? Is at some point Jordan Love and every other quarterback will hit a plateau. And that's when we know who they are as a quarterback. There are certain quarterbacks, and we talked, I, I should think actually the last time we talked of like at some point, Mitch Trubisky, there were signs of progress at times they go to a playoff game. At some point he hit a plateau. The Bears knew it, everyone else knew it, and that was kind of it. And he's had a little bit of a revamp and he'll maybe get a chance with the Steelers. We'll see. But he hit a plateau and that was it. Mitch Trubisky was basically sort of done growing as a quarterback. And at some point, Jordan Love will hit a plateau, but he hasn't yet, which is huge. He continues to progress, which is huge. And we can, you know, squabble about where he should right. be in that progression right now and what that ultimately becomes. Those are all really good, fun points of conversation and debate. But the one thing I'm very adamant about that you cannot debate is that he has shown progress. And I would have said even prior to last week, if we were, you know, same conversation a week ago, I would have said it was incremental progress and it was still better than it was a season ago and those sort of things. But Wednesday's practice last week, where he did, you know, dominated the Saints in red zone and in the two minute drill, hits the 50 yard bomb to Toure and the two point conversion, three for four in red zone with three touchdowns, all on great balls. Like that showed progress. But I wanted to see, like, okay, can he carry it over into a game? Because that's what I want to see is the consistency. And then he did. And not only did he carry it over in the game, would he like to have throws back, the Deguara throw, maybe one of the throws sure. to Amari? Sure. Right. So, it, you know, Aaron Rodgers would like to have a handful of, you know, throws back every single game. But the thing that I saw, was a player who is developing confidence, who is playing with much better fundamentals, and who is not afraid to take throws that some literal quarterbacks will not even attempt in games because they simply can't make those throws. And that is yep. incredibly exciting. And again, what that ultimately becomes, and if that amounts to a starting quarterback, we will all have to wait and see. But if any, if everyone's not excited that there has been legitimate progress for a quarterback who was a first round pick, and I don't care if anyone thinks they should have taken him or not, the talent that he possessed as a rookie coming out of Utah State was real. And if he did get taken at the end of the first, he was at worst going to get taken at the beginning of the second because he had all of those unique traits. And now we're starting to actually see some of those unique traits get used in an in-game situation. Against a vanilla defense, sure. Against some backups, sure. But not with his full weapon of, dis you know, uh, disposal right. of weapons either, right? So, like, I don't know. I was very encouraged over the back-to-back -back practice and game situations uh, against the Saints. And now I want to see more. I want to see how he does 
this Thursday against Kansas City. And quite frankly, I'm very much more excited about that game now that we've had a couple of really impressive performances from Jordan Love. I couldn't agree more. And for everyone listening at home, I okay, we're done with Jordan Love. There it is. I I was I had to ask Andy about it because it seems to be a requisite here in the Packers blogosphere, so to speak. And it, I like I said, I thought you you hit the nail on the head Thank in you. your video the other day, and you expounded a little bit more here, and I appreciate it. Uh, let's move in front of Jordan Love. Let's look at the guys playing in front of him, uh, the offensive line. Another really promising outing for Zach Tom. Uh, up and down the line, I thought there were some nice things. It's interesting to me, one guy I don't hear a lot about, and you watch the tape and I can kind of understand in the sense of there's nothing that really wows you, but there's nothing that concerns you either. Josh Myers is a guy who... When you think about it, okay, yeah, second-year player, et cetera, but he missed so much time last year. I think a lot of people think it's a given that he is just going to come in, hit the ground running, and it's fascinating to me that I don't see anything with him that makes me really excited, but I also don't see anything with him that gets me concerned. So I'm just curious as to your take as far as is this a guy who is you know right where he should be considering, like I said, how much time he missed last year? Or is he leaving plays out there? Is he is he not regressing, but is he maybe not taking that next step developmentally that we would like to see? Like where do you where do you peg Josh Myers at this point? No, I like that you bring him up because he was a player last year and you get only a handful of games that he's actually able to start in a little bit more than that. But um and when he played, I thought he was good for a rookie, but I think everyone sort of thought that he was good. And good for a rookie and good is are two totally different things. Very rookie, different things. If right, you're good right. for a rookie, that's really good. Like you, that's exactly where you want right. to be. That's a very good right. thing. That's not a diss on Josh Myers. But if no, you were to say start. like, all right, watch Josh Myers in comparison to the top 15 centers in the league, you'd be like, okay, we've got some work to do. But he had a good first right. season as a rookie. And that's exactly what you want. But I think, you know, th this idea that he just all of a sudden comes in in year two and takes this step and all of a sudden now is good, good. And like, he's ready to go and set it and forget it. You don't have to worry about it. And there's no simple overlap there. Like you have to earn that. And I think so far for the most part, I've been encouraged what I've seen out of Josh Myers. And I think you also mentioned the biggest thing, right? That you're not seeing the mistakes. I know Rogers got after him a couple of times in practice for uh, right. some things he would have liked to have done differently, but that's going to happen when you're the center for Aaron Rodgers from time to time. And uh, overall I've been encouraged. I thought his first game uh, against the 49ers was uh, a little bit better than his second game against the saints. But I think as he starts getting consistent reps and playing with, you know, hopefully John running jr. And they figure out whoever they want at that right guard position. I um, mean, he starts playing with the same guy over and over. I think that's going to settle him down. And as this season goes on, I expect to see him to continue to progress. So um, uh, good, only good things so far, but I I'm intrigued to see how he plays once the season starts. Speaking of figuring out who he's playing next to, I mean, obviously I do think run is going to be since we've seen now, uh, we've seen, you know, Jenkins start to work with the ones in walkthroughs at right tackle. But do you think, I mean, do you think Jenkins should be at tackle? Where, where, where do you fall on that? Because I understand that, you know, right, the tackle position in and of itself is so important. But, you know, Jenkins has made his bones so far in this league as one of the premier guards. And I do wonder if just setting it and forgetting it, to, to use your phrase, as far as, okay, we're just going to put Jenkins at right tackle. He's going to have to hit the ground running at a position where he is somewhat unfamiliar. And I know we all talk about his versatility and how he can play all five spots. And that's all true, but it's not automatic. It's not Madden. It's not, you just drop him and let him go. I mean, I would think all the bank reps he has at guard yeah. would speak to, okay, maybe giving pause to that thought just a little bit. Yeah. So I, I could go in a few different directions here. A part of me wants to be like, Hey, let's just assume everyone's healthy, right? Like just put Bakhtiari at left tackle and Jenkins at left guard and have a dominant left side of your offensive line and let those guys cook. And you, you don't have to worry about the blind side. And if you want to run left, you can run left because you've got Bakhtiari on the left and Jenkins on the left and you're going to be good to go. And when back when you had Lindsley at center and Jenkins at left guard and Bakhtiari at left tackle, man, was that freaking fun to watch. So fun to watch. Yeah. part of me wants to see that. But I also sort of don't want to necessarily see John Runyon Jr. have to move around a ton. And I kind of just like that he's settled into left guard and kind of want to have him make that his. Um, the other thing that I could see is, you know, you've got Bakhtiar at left tackle. You've got Runyon at left guard. You've got Myers at center. And let's just say you set Elton Jenkins at right tackle. 
Now a part of me is just like, all right, the other five guys that you've got that could potentially be guys down the line are all capable of playing right guard, right? Like Sean Ryan, Zach Tom, Jake Hansen, Royce Newman, Cole Van Lannan, like all five of them potentially right guard. Let those five just fight out right guard and like everything else. <laughs> right. you, like, and, and you've got everything else set. You can set those. And now right guard will be the one that has the competition. So part of me wants to see that. The other thing that I could also see is I'm also sort of an old school believer in like, you have your finesse on the left and you got your power on the right. So part of me wants to be like, you put Jenkins at right tackle and put running at right guard and have a little bit more power on your right side, have Bakhtiari and Zach Tom on your left side and have a little bit more finesse on the left and then have Myers beat the glue that kind of brings it all together. I could go anything. The best thing is that they have options. They have versatility. And I trust the hell out of Adam Stenovich and Luke Butkus to figure out whatever five is going to work best and whatever order is going to work best. And that works for me. And I think they've got a lot of great options there. Yeah, the options is a very real thing. And maybe, maybe they get a little paralysis by analysis at, at times, such as in the playoff game. I'm not going to bring it up. Wait, did I just do that? Wait, ah, uh, we're going to move on because do I don't you know I'm, not, I'm the only defender of what they did in that playoff game. I think I'm I only- know you are. I know you are. I mean, I'm just not a fan of having a guy in, a in Josh you know, they were who has started X amount of games for you at a really high level, and then you just pull him like that is that's I get it. That, I get it. that's an argument for another time for another beer or whatever um let's look at the, the the running back spot because obviously aj and aaron are going to be there that's that's a foregone conclusion the third running back spot and we've heard matt talk about this and, and i know it's a little bit boring but it's so true is going to be decided by special teams like it doesn't matter what these guys do from scrimmage so much as it does like what they are able to contribute on teams with that said I really like what I've seen from Tyler Goodson. Holy cow. And that's that's not to take away what Patrick Taylor's done. Uh, He's done a really nice job with what he's been asked to do, especially in pass pro. But man, Tyler Goodson is fun. I hope he he gets the nod there because, I mean, it just seems like every time he touches the ball and maybe he's had a little bit better, uh, more to work with up front than, than Patrick has. But man, he is fun to watch with the ball in his hand. He really is. And, you know, I know they could go in a couple of different directions. I know Brian Gudikins talked about, you know, he, again, you mentioned special teams and pass protection. Like those are the things that they're looking for in that number three running back spot, which leads you to believe Patrick Taylor. I kind of go back to, and I know it's a playoff game. I know it's against the 49ers, but AJ Dillon goes down and you've got Aaron Jones, you got Patrick Taylor on the roster and they didn't use Patrick Taylor at all, which leads me to believe that they don't necessarily trust him in taking that jump in that, you know, sort of power running back sort of position. And they just went with Aaron Jones for the rest of the game. And I sort I know. Of what's like- funny is they did use him for like two snaps, I think, in that drive at the end of the third quarter. Mm-hmm. But that was literally just to give Aaron a blow. And then Aaron yeah. was back. And then Aaron was back. Right. So and I actually feel like from last year to this year, I haven't seen a ton of progress from Patrick Taylor, which I was kind of hoping to see because this is like his right. first full training camp and everything like that. He kind of feels like the same guy to me, which isn't bad. I've been a supporter of Patrick Taylor and I like who he is. Um, but you look at Tyler Goodson and what he can do with the football in his hands. And it's just two totally different players. And I know that this isn't exactly like you you don't need this guy to go out and touch the ball 20 times a game. But I'll tell you what, if I need this guy to go out and touch the ball 20 times a game, I feel a lot better about what Tyler Goodson's going to do with those 20 touch touches than, um, than Patrick Taylor is at this point. So I know that special teams are going to play a part. I know that Kylan Hill is coming back at some point, and now you've got probably three runners that are ahead of Tyler Goodson on the depth chart. So do you need that guy? So I get the the ideal of Patrick Taylor, but man, again, if you're just trying to get, you know, keep your best guys and who could help you long-term, it just feels like Goodson is a, a step ahead of Patrick Taylor there. Couldn't agree more. Let's flip it over to the defensive side of the ball. Uh, what do you make of uh, Isaiah McDuffie? Because like, look, I thought last year in the summer, I, I literally saw just a guy. Like I saw not much there. Maybe you could help him on teams. And I know he struggled with injuries throughout the season, et cetera. But man, he's really come to play this summer. And I don't think it's a question of, oh, he's playing backups or, no. you know, anything of that nature. I think he's really improved. And I was wondering what your eyes have seen. Yeah, we talked about Jordan Love on offense and his improvements that he made. I would argue that Love's the most improved player on offense from last training camp to to this year. I would say the exact same thing about Isaiah McDuffie on defense. Uh, You said it perfectly. He was a guy at best on the team a season ago. I used maybe a couple special teams things here and there, but I didn't see anything as a linebacker. Looked undersized, didn't always look ready. Like The biggest thing is not only has he looked fast physically, but he's looked fast mentally and just anticipating where the play is going to go and getting there. There's a play against the Saints 
um, where the, the Saints were trying to run right. And he jumps outside, sets the edge, and forces everything back inside. Like I know exactly what you're playing. When they're going, yep, they're going on the right. And I, yeah. I think I tweeted about it live because it's like it's such an impressive play as far as from the inside spot to get out there and completely funnel everything back inside was really impressive. Man, if Rashawn Gary was setting the edge on that play, I would have been like, that was a heck of I would have noted it being like, that was a heck of a play by Rashawn Gary to set the edge and funnel everything back inside. For an inside linebacker to have the speed and anticipation to get out there, the physicality to hold up at the point of attack and then force everything back inside, that was a wow play to me. And he's tackled everything in sight. He's been solid in coverage. This is going to be a a ton of Devondre Campbell and Quay Walker, but man, it you know, he's making it so that like they got to at least, in, you know, think about is there like a three linebacker set that we can use or something <laughs> to, to get him on the field? That's how impressive he's been to me. I mean, it's not. And like, look, possibly there's a way to get him on the field. But even if there isn't, I mean, how much better do you feel about if and when injuries strike, which they always do say, remember back down uh, the last game, they were down in New Orleans when Ty Summers has to come in and he's flailing yeah. about trying to chase Alvin Kamara. I feel a hell of a lot better about Isaiah McDuffie coming in at this point. If, you know, something were to happen, one of these guys inside, well, I I don't feel terrible. I don't want it to happen, obviously, but I don't feel terrible about McDuffie stepping in to get me through the rest of the game. You know, I think one of the the crazy things so far um, for the defense, because we all knew like the starting 11 for this defense was going to be really, you know, potentially really good. Right. But like the depth was the major question. You look at some of the guys who've had the biggest, you know, um, you know, increases, I think, in and in level of confidence in their play from start of training camp to now along the defensive line, TJ Slayton and Jerron Reed, I feel like have taken, you know, major steps Big along time. the defensive line. Big Isaiah time. McDuffie, right. the inside linebacker has been super impressive. Uh, Kingsley and Igbari has been coming on very much of late. Now you've got guys like Kobe Jones that are coming out of nowhere and even starting to make an impact. I, I feel like uh, Shamar John Charles has had another really impressive you talk uh, about another guy, exactly. night and day, Amen. night and day from last year. Exactly. I mean, the, the the work the work that he has done, especially because last year they ran him almost exclusively at the slot. This year, I think we've seen a little bit more on the perimeter, but they've still put him at the slot at times. And it's just not to me. It's just night and day. I mean, that you talk about a guy who's developing. I mean, that's been to me. It's been really noteworthy for John Charles. This is just why, like. When you, it takes time for players in the NFL to develop and they're not finished products in year one. Like even me and you, like who know this to a T and like in practice and preach it day in and day out. If you would have told me last year that Isaiah McDuffie or Shamar Jean Charles would have, you know, amounted to, to much, we'll see again, we'll see what it ultimately amounts to. But like, I would have told you both those guys, like, they're just guys, they don't got it. Like, what, what are we doing here? Like, you're just taking reps from somebody who's ultimately going to be on the team down the road. But man, right. the, the effort, time, energy that they put in um, and, and how much better they are in year two, like, we just got to give these rookies time because the the transition from, from college to the pros is legit. It is a lot to handle. And we're seeing now um, these guys in year two who are literally making that year two jump. You love it. You love to see it. All right. I'm talking to Andy Herman from the Pack-A-Day podcast. Andy, before I let you go, I got to ask you the question du jour, the question of the week, the question of the summer that apparently the media will not let go like a fucking Rottweiler. They keep asking this. Do you play the starters on Thursday night? What What is Coach Herman doing there? Because I know Coach LaFleur keeps hedging and, and hemming and hawing. And by the time this is up, maybe he's even announced it. But I want to know what Andy Herman does heading into Thursday night. Do you play the starters in this final preseason game? Yeah, Eileen, probably not. I mean, you go back to the the 49ers game. Um, I love how you year. know that like every fan is like gonna hate you for answering that way. So you're like your whole demeanor goes, Yeah, probably yeah. not. I probably don't. <laughs> No, I mean, the re- actually, the reason that my demeanor is that way is because there's no right answer to the question. And Matt sort of alluded to that the other day, too, right? There is right. It's an impossible question that there's no – the only way you know the right answer is once the game is done and once you start to start the yeah. season. Because I get, like, the way that they handled preseason last year probably did amount – maybe they lose to the Saints anyway. But I guarantee you, if they're, you know, probably play more in the preseason, they don't get beat that bad. Like, that was – brutal and embarrassing to watch a, a game like that where you're not even competitive and again that's not even on the the, the saints home soil like that was right that was disgustingly right. bad and if they played players more in the preseason i think that does look a little bit better at the same token if they go out and play their guys and you've got an acl injury to an important player you're going to be kicking yourself forever that you play the guy so there's there's literally no right answer ahead of time and i can understand both sides of the equation the the, the reason i would lean in that direction and, and not playing them is because to me 
they can lose that first game to Minnesota again. They're going to finish first in the NFC by the end of the year, unless something catastrophic happens, which at that point you're screwed anyway. Um, so they're going to finish first in the NFC North. They're going to finish in the playoff spot. And I don't really care anymore if they get the first seed or the seventh seed because it doesn't I seem mean, to matter. For real. I mean, like, it doesn't seem to matter if they get the one anyway. So like they just got to be playing their best football come January. That's what I'm concerned about. Regular season and, you know, be damned. They're going to be there. I just want to see people be healthy. And to me, that starts with not, you know, putting guys in harm's way in a game that doesn't mean a ton. So I lean that way. If they go in the other direction, I get it. I understand it. There's no perfect solution, but that's probably where I would go. Yeah, I'm I'm totally with you 100% on that, and especially now. I mean, it was always a long freaking season, but now they've added a regular season game. It's like, to me, it makes zero sense to put them out there. But if they are going to play, I'm with Aaron Rodgers in the sense of, like, at least let them play a quarter. Like, yeah. let them play a little bit, because I don't think that, you know, 8, 12 snaps is going to do much for you in two weeks' time when you go to Minnesota. Like, that, to me, means absolutely nothing. I like Aaron Rodgers comments too, of like, what is, you know, what is 15 to 20 snaps of him going against a vanilla defense going to do for it? It's like, I, they can help a little bit, I'm sure. And you can do some checks at the line and get maybe some timing down with, but like right. going to, up against a, you know, a super insane Packers defense day in and day out of practice is probably going to be a lot more valuable for him than, than playing those 10 to 12 reps against a vanilla defense. So we'll see, we'll see what they do. I couldn't agree more. Andy Herman always bringing the heat there. Pack a day podcast, Packer report, Packers everywhere on the internet. It's what he does. The man, the myth, the legend. Andy, thanks so much for joining me, man. Appreciate it, man. Have a good one.